the trap set. On Saturday morning, John B. John B. Winters sent verbal word to the Gold Hill Assay Office that he desired to see me at the Yellow Jacket office. Though such a request struck me as decidedly cool in view of his own recent discourtesies to me, they're alike as a publisher and as a stockholder in the Yellow Jacket mine. And though it seemed to me more like a summons than the courteous request by one gentleman to another for a favor, hoping that some conference with Sharon looking to the betterment of mining matters in Nevada might arise from it, I felt strongly inclined to overlook what possibly was simply an oversight and courtesy. But as then it had only been two days since I had been bruised and beaten under a hasty and false apprehension of facts, my caution was somewhat aroused. Moreover, I remembered sensitively his contemptuousness of manner to me at my last interview in his office. I therefore felt it needful, if I went at all, to go accompanied by a friend, whom he would not dare to treat, treat with incivility, and whose presence with me might secure exemption from insult. Accordingly, I asked a neighbor to accompany me. The Trap Almost Detected Although I was not then aware of this fact, it would seem that previous to my request, this same neighbor had heard Dr. Zabriskie state publicly in a saloon that Mr. Winters had told him he had decided either to kill or to horsewhip me, but had not finally decided on which. My neighbor, therefore, felt unwilling to go down with me until he had first called on Mr. Winters alone. He therefore paid him a visit. From that interview, he assured me that he gathered the impression that he did not believe I would have any difficulty with Mr. Winters, and that he, Winters, would call on me at four o'clock in my own office. My own precautions. As Sheriff Cummings was in Gold Hill that afternoon, and as I desired to converse with him about the previous assault, I invited him to my office and he came. Although a half hour had passed before beyond four o'clock, Mr. Winters had, had not called, and we both of us began preparing to go home. Just then Philip Lynch, publisher of the Gold Hill News, came in and said blandly and cheerily, as if bringing good news, Hello, John B. Winters wants to see you. I replied, Indeed. Why, he sent me word that he would call on me here this afternoon at four o'clock. Oh, well, it don't do to be too ceremonious just now. He's in our, my office, and that will do as well. Come on in. Winters wants to consult with you alone. He's got something to say to you. Though slightly uneasy at this change of program, yet believing that in an editor's house I ought to be safe, and anyhow that I would be within hail of the street, I hurriedly and but partially whispered my d dim apprehensions to Mr. Cummings, and asked him if he would not keep near enough to hear my voice in case I should call. He consented to do so while waiting for some other parties, and to come in if he heard my voice or thought I had need of protection. On reaching the editorial part of the news office, which viewed from the street is dark, I did not see Mr. Winters, and again my misgivings arose. Had I paused long enough to consider the case, I should have invited Sheriff Cummings in, but as Lynch went downstairs, he said, This way, we can't. It's best to be private, or some such remark. Parentheses. I do not desire to strain the reader's fancy hurtfully, and yet it would be a favor to me if he would try to fancy this lamb in battle, or the dueling ground, or in the head of a vig or a, or at the head of a vigilance committee. M T close parentheses. I followed and without Mr Cummings, and without arms, which I never do or will carry unless as a soldier in war or unless I should yet come to feel I must fight a duel, or to join and aid to the ranks of a necessary vigilance committee. But by following I made a fatal mistake. Following was entering a trap, and whatever animal suffers itself to be caught should expect the common fate of a caged rat, as I fear events to come will prove. Traps commonly are not set for benevolence. His body bodyguard is shut out, 
the trap inside. I followed Lynch downstairs. At their foot, a door to the left opened into a small room. From that room, another door opened, and yet another door, another room. And once entered, I found myself inveigled into what may well ever henceforth regard as a private subterranean gold hill den, admirably adapted in proper hands to the purposes of murder, raw or disguised, for from it, with both or even one door closed, when too late, I saw that I could not be heard by Sheriff Cummings, and, by, and from it, by violence and by force, I was prevented from making a peaceable exit. When I thought I saw the studious object of this consultation was no other than to compa compass my killing, in the presence of Philip Lynch as a witness, as so on as by insult a proverbially excitable man should be exasperated to the point of assailing Mr. Winters <coughs> so that Mr. Lynch, by his conscience and by his well-known tenderness of heart toward the rich and potent, would be compelled to testify that he saw General John B. Winters kill Conrad Wiegand in, quote, self-defense, unquote. But I am going too fast. Our host, Mr. Lynch, was present during the most of the time, say a little short of an hour, but three times he left the room. His testimony, therefore, would be available only as to the bulk of what transpired. On entering this carpeted den, I was invited to a seat near one corner of the room. Mr. Lynch took a seat near the window. J.B. Winters sat at first near the door and began his remarks essentially as follows. I have come here to exact of you a retraction in black and white of those damnable false charges which you have preferred against me and that blank, blank, infamous lying sheet of yours and you must declare yourself their author that you published them knowing them to be false and that your motives were malicious. Hold, Mr. Winters, your language is insulting, and you demand an enormity. I trust I was not invited here either to be insulted or coerced. I suppose myself here by invitation of Mr. Lynch at your request. <coughs> Nor did I come here to insult you. I have already told you that I am here for a very different purpose. Your, yet your language has been offensive and even now shows strong excitement. If insult is repeated, I shall either leave the room or call in Sheriff Cummings, whom I just left standing and waiting for me outside the door. No, you won't, sir. You may just as well understand it at once as not. Here you are my man, and I'll tell you why. Months ago you put your property out of your hands, boasting that you did so to escape losing it on prosecution for libel. It is true that I did convert all my immovable property into personal property, such as I could trust safely to others, and chiefly to escape ruin through possible libel suits. Very good, sir. Having placed yourself beyond the pale of the law, may God help your soul if you don't make precisely such a retraction as I have demanded. I've got you now, and by blank, before you can get out of this room... You've got to both write and sign precisely the retraction I have demanded. And before you go anyhow, blank, you blank, blank, low, living, blank, lying, blank, blank. I'll teach you what personal responsibility is outside of the law. And by blank, Sheriff Cummings and all the friends you've got in the world, besides can't you, you, blank, blank, etc., no, sir, I'm alone now, and I'm prepared to be shot down just here and now, rather than be vilified by you as I have been, and suffer you to escape me after publishing those charges, not only here, where I am known and universally respected, but where I am not personally known and may be injured. I confess this speech with its terrible and but too plainly implied threat, of killing me if I did not sign the paper he demanded terrified me, especially as I saw he was working himself up to the highest possible pitch of passion 
An instinct told me that any reply other than one of seeming concession to his demands would only be fuel to a raging fire. So I replied, Well, if I've got to sign... And then I paused some time. Resuming, I said, But, Mr. Winters, you are greatly excited. Besides, I see you are laboring under a total misapprehension. <clears throat> it is your duty not to inflame, but to calm yourself. I am prepared to show you, if you will only point out the article that you allude to, that you regard as charges, what no calm and logical mind has any right to regard.